Hello, welcome to the Theology Pugcast on a hot summer day here in New England. It's baking outside, but I hope you're cool where you are. We are glad to be with you once again, and I'm C.R. Wiley, the senior pastor of the Presbyterian Church of Manchester, and I've written a bunch of stuff. And I'm joined by my friends, as I always am. So, Tom, introduce yourself. Um, Tom Price, systematic theologian and Christian ethicist, teaching both at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. And I'm Glenn Sunshine. I am a professor of history at Central Connecticut State University, a senior fellow at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, and I run a ministry called Every Summer Ministries. All right. Well, we want to let folks know before we get into the show just where things are with our Indiegogo campaign, and I have good news. We have reached our goal. We're already over $4,000 raised with about nine days to go. And I think when folks hear this show, depending on where they hear it, we could be seven days to go, five days to go, three days to go. But anyway, the reason I bring it up is not, is, is not just to celebrate the fact that we've got a lot of folks out there who have pledged to the campaign, and we're very grateful for that. Uh, I'm here to let you know that uh, the, the, the fellow who gave us that challenge grant or that challenge gift, just to kind of remind folks what, what I'm talking about, when we reached $2,000, we had, a, we had a, a supporter of the show say, I will pledge $1,000 toward all the uh, you know, gifts up to $1,000 to come. So that'll take us to $4,000. And that's what happened. As soon as we let folks know about that challenge gift, boom, within days, we had another $1,000 pledged and then that uh, that generous donor matched that so that was what took us over four thousand dollars now the challenge donor has said let's go for the stars and he's <laughs> uh, challenged us with another challenge gift of a thousand dollars so in the remaining days of the indiegogo campaign if if folks pledge uh, an additional thousand dollars he'll match it which will take us up to six thousand dollars and uh, our tech my son Caleb said he can figure out uses for that. <laughs> that will make the show even better. So as folks may recall, we're going to have a new website. We're going to have new microphones. We're going to have funds to help us support all of our efforts and make sure that we're you know, providing resources to people on the website. So this is all good. We're very grateful. So thank you for giving. And if you'd like to give some more, just so you know, if you give $50, it's going to be $100. If you give $100, it'll be $200. You get the picture. Anyway, with all that stuff out of the way, oh, you want to say something uh, there, Tom? Uh, just to remind them that with that also are certain incentives, right? T-shirts and uh, right. pint glasses. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The merch, as they say. The merch. Yeah. We, we've got yeah. some merch on the way. Yeah, and I, I would add just as, um, as a reminder or to reinforce what you just said, we don't get anything ourselves out of the fundraising. None of this goes into our pocket. It's all gear for the show, equipment, um, paying for the website, uh, maintenance, all of those kinds of things. So this is just purely for the benefit of the show. Well, that's uh, a good thing to note. Now, there, just so folks know, there is uh, a, a, a stream of funds that we do receive from the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network through the memberships, and uh, we're very grateful for those. All those funds do go to underwrite the ongoing costs of producing the show. So, we do, again, that's not uh, money that goes into our pockets. Just so folks know, we're not getting rich <laughs> off, off, of the, uh, off the show. I have one last point <laughs> before we get going. <laughs> uh, we've been getting a lot of emails from fans, and uh, we appreciate all of these. I've tried to get back to a few of you. Um, if you've got lost in the stream, feel free to send something back. Um, we'll try to respond, but we are each uh, working on different works, different webinars, uh, different uh, – we're working on building sources so that uh, there's a lot of follow-up to the questions you have and you're not just kind of left hanging after a show. So this stuff is in the works too. And uh, that's coming from just our own efforts and, and in many cases. So uh, just so people know that uh, uh, we are working very hard to get uh, a lot of substance to you. <laughs> yeah, that's great to bring that up, Tom. Well, speaking of substance, why don't we talk about today's substance? Today's there we show. go. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm reading right now a marvelous book uh, entitled uh, The Beginning of Wisdom, uh, <clears throat> Readings in Genesis by Leon R. Cass. Now, I think you've heard of Leon Cass, uh, you guys have. And, uh, but just for the, the sake of our, our show and our listeners, uh, who is this guy? Well, Leon Cass is the, the A.D. Clark Harding Professor uh, in the Committee on Social Thought and the College at the University of Chicago, and he's the Hurt 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 Fellow on Social Thought at the American Enterprise Institute. Now, where I originally heard about Leon Cass was this next uh, this next thing from his bio. He's a member of the President's Council on Bioethics, or he was, and he is an author and co-author of six books. Uh, most recently. A Life, Liberty, and the Defense of Dignity, The Challenge of Bioethics. Now, <clears throat> another book that I have by Leon Cass is Wing to Wing and Oar to Oar, which he wrote with his wife, who's also a scholar, and I think she's <clears throat> also on faculty at the University of Chicago, <clears throat> Amy, Amy Cass. <clears throat> so, uh, now, Leon Cass is, a, is, is Jewish and a very uh, uh, thoughtful uh, commentator on the Western tradition, including the uh, the parts of the Western tradition that are not Jewish. <laughs> he's a he's a, a scholar who addresses uh, philosophical themes drawn from you know classic works such as you know Plato's polit uh, po Plato's uh, Republic and Aristotle's Politics and so forth. So this is a, a what I would call a philosophical reading of Genesis, and uh, he so he brings to the reading th just his vast. Uh, you know, uh, you know, sort of, uh, I don't know, um, treasury of, of knowledge uh, that he he has acquired from his broad reading in in the Western tradition, uh, and he's coming to the 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 work of Genesis or the Book of Genesis uh, like a philosopher uh, would, or as a philosopher, seeking to understand Genesis. Uh, as as a work that speaks to the human condition generally. Now uh, he he's obviously a, a Jewish, uh, and consequently he's not looking for uh, types of Christs in Genesis. <laughs> <laughs> that's just not that's just not on the radar for him. Now that doesn't mean that he's unaware. He in fact at certain points in the in the course of the reading, uh, he does let you know that he's. He, he knows who Augustine is, <laughs> and, he, and he's read his Augustine, and, and so forth. But uh, consequently, his angle of vision is uh, an angle of vision that might be a little different than uh, the typical podcast uh, you know, listener is, is acquainted with. And uh, as, I, as I was working my way through uh, his treatment, of the first 11 chapters in particular of Genesis, I couldn't help but think about the, the cultural moment in the West that we're in at the, at the, at the present time. And the, the two stories that I'd like to bring, you know, and raise up for our consideration today uh, are the stories of Noah and his sons and what immediately follows, following the genealogy, which is, of course, uh, the Babel account story of Babel. Now, both of those stories, I think, are, are significant for us, but I, I, I suspect uh, that most people don't think about the story of Noah and his sons and don't think about that particular story as having any kind of relevance for much of anything. <laughs> of course, I'm referring to the, the famous account where after the flood, after the, the Notahide covenant, after, um, you know, uh, the promise uh, you know, with it, that God would not destroy the, the, the world in, in the manner that he did uh, with the flood again. Uh, we more or less kind of kind of jump forward in, in the book of Genesis and don't really attend to what follows in terms of the genealogies, but also this particular story of uh, Noah and his drunken uh, stupor. Now, this particular, this particular story... Uh, I, I, need, I think that we need to say that often it's used in a uh, in a in a sort of racially charged, ideologically uh, sort of uh, tendentious way, and because of that, I think that a number of people have kind of uh, 
well, just kind of tiptoed around the story and not, want to, not wanted to treat it because they're afraid that if they do, they'll get sort of drawn into some kind of racially charged or racial charge <laughs> that, uh, that they don't want to be associated with. But the thing that I'd like to do as I, as I look at this story is not think about the, the, that way of treating the story. I'd like to think about Noah and his sons in a more sort of prototypical or archetypical way. And what you have in the story, of course, is this. this. It's found in uh, Genesis chapter 9, beginning at verse 18. So let me just read the story to, re to refresh everyone's memory. Uh, uh, memories, and then I'll, I'll read a few things from uh, Cass's treatment and, and see how he, how he addresses the theme, and this is, by the way, I'll let me just kind of give, a, give away what he, what he thinks the story is primarily about. He thinks the story is primarily about impiety. Hmm. So with that, with that in mind, and you have to have the classical understanding of piety in mind hmm. to, to get what he's getting at. So, here, here's how it goes. Beginning at verse 18. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, by the way, uh, Cass uh, brings out that Japheth is actually the oldest, Shem is the second, and Ham is the youngest. We, have, we, we know that from you know, other material in the book of Genesis. But anyway, here it goes. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these were the people of the whole earth. Uh, from these, the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on their shoulders, both on their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. And also he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Now, this is, like so many stories in Genesis, it's told very economically, and if you just sort of left it as, as sort of, oh, and by the way, this is what happened. <laughs> uh, the end. <laughs> and, and just kind of left it as, as just kind of a historical data, just sort of facts or factoids, as they like to say, uh, without any sort of in, in sense that this may be indicating something more significant. Then you could just sort of just jump right over this story and move on to the next story uh, and say, well, I understand that little bit of trivia is there, but what's the point? Well, there is a, a significant point for Leon Cass. But before I get to his point, I was wondering if you guys had any points that you'd like to make. Well, you know, the, the sort of surface thing that you can go to immediately is it explains the conquest of the land of Canaan. Right. You know, right. why is it that the descendants of Shem, that is to say the Hebrews, right end up having a right um, to conquer the Canaanite territories. This is part of what's going on there right. uh, in terms of the larger picture. Um, and then with, I'd, I'd rather not get into the whole racial interpretation of this, which seems to me to be, a, to be polite about it, it seems to me to be a really far stretch about what's really going on in the story, but people do go there. Right. In fact, they, I think many of the people think that's the point. You know, kind of, you know, that, that, that whole thing is where we're supposed to go. But I think, I think what Cass is getting at is, is that the, the very act of, of Ham at this moment is something that's true not just then, but keeps being true again and again and again. In other words, this is a story that's emblematic 
of a particular kind of problem at the and it's and it's in piety. So we'll get into that in a minute. But do you have anything you want to say there, Tom? Um, no, I mean I, I can see. I mean, just the initial thing. I can see how all the hints towards Babel are starting to be set up, um, right. and that, that's yeah. just. But I'd rather wait till we get there to kind of. <laughs> The right. comments on it. No, well, no, I think. Yeah, yeah, and Nimrod is a is a descendant of Ham. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so yeah. now what what we can do though is is this last episode. Think about it, this last episode leaves a kind of stain in our memories when it comes to Noah. Yeah. To up to this point though, Noah's is sort of handled himself pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we go back into chapter uh, six, we find. Uh, this this line, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So that's our and that's our introduction to Noah. Yeah, and uh, oh. he, he stands out as a contrast. Yep. Right, and and there is, I think, a really important point of that going all the way back to Genesis three, where there's the promise that the seed of the woman was going to come and defeat Satan. So the question is, is it Noah? Okay. Noah yep. is, maybe Noah is the guy who is going to restart everything. He's going to be the new Adam, the second Adam. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, it's in Genesis 9, after the flood, that we have a reassertion that humanity is made in the image of God. Oh, yeah. Right. You know, when you get in Genesis 4, Adam, Adam's sons are described as being in the image of Adam, not in the yeah. image of God. Yeah. So maybe Noah is the guy who's fulfilling the promise to Eve, and then this happens. <laughs> right, which brings up something interesting that to consider, particularly when it's the relationship to providence. When, it, when you're dealing with providence, you're dealing with something that's manifold in character. In other words, God has a way of getting a lot of things across in one swift, simple act. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whereas, whereas human beings need to do a lot of different things to get a lot of things done. God can do a single thing and get a lot of things done. But you're right. You know, there is, there is something here that reminds us about the fact that Noah isn't the person yeah. that we're looking for. And that, that, that even ties to something we talked about in previous episode and the way Scripture talks about those other than the Messiah. And it, it makes its its heroes of the faith very flawed, fallen people. Um, and, and there is something very much tied to that point Glenn just made, because these are not the incarnate son of God, the Messiah, right. the deliverer, but they are part of the trajectory of, of God, bring, you know, making, making ready a body for, for that Messiah. Yeah. Now, I want to get to this because this is mm -hmm. tremendously important. I think, you know, one of the things that uh, is really significant to keep in mind is that the Jews didn't, um, they didn't turn these people into plaster saints. Mm -hmm. they, these, these, are, these are human beings, and their warts are recorded for us. Nevertheless, this particular story provides us with uh, an, the action of Noah's sons and how they regard uh, their father after God has used them to save their bacon. There's a little joke there, <laughs> the bacon. <laughs> but anyway, it, he saved them, and God used, and, and we're, but we're told that uh, Noah was a righteous man and simple, and that... Uh, and that he was wholehearted in, in his devotion to the Lord. So uh, he does what he's told. Uh, he prepares an ark without a, a whole lot of information beside the, the nature of the box that he was supposed to create. He's, he's, to, he's told that, uh, that, you know, God's wrath is going to be poured out. But, you know, he's going, uh, he's, going uh, he's acting on God's word, and this is praiseworthy. Now, the thing about this particular, you know, brief episode is the amount of information that's kind of packed into it. And I'm referring, of course, to this episode with, with Noah's drunkenness. Now, I want to read a few things here from Cass that I think are worth noting. He says here, we pause over the names of Noah's sons. He presumably gave them. Shem means name. Not only in appellation, but also renown or respect. 
The word name has already occurred many times in Genesis, referring not only to the identities of rivers and animals and persons, but also to fame and renown, as in men of renown in uh, chapter 6, verse 4. Shem also has been used on, the, uh, on at least one occasion in connection with God. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord, in four, chapter 4, verse 26. Later, Hashem, the name, will be a pious way of referring to the Lord. Though we cannot know which meaning Noah had in mind when he named his son Shem, we suspect that because he was born in the heroic age, before the flood, Shem uh, was named by Noah in the hope of fame and renown. The name Ham, uh, this story's central character, means hot or warm, from the verb meaning to make warm, to become hot, to inflame oneself. The name Japheth means expansion, from a root meaning open, though it may also be related to uh, Yaheth, 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 uh, meaning beautiful. Three sons, name or renown, hot or inflammable, open or expanded or beautiful. We wonder what Noah had in mind with these namings. We, we wonder also whether the namings proved prophetic, whether there was destiny in the names of Noah's sons. So anyway, so this, this sets it up. We've got these names. Now, then he goes on to note the, 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 the birth order. There is something strange about the order of names, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham, the central character, is the youngest son. Shem, who turns out to be the model son, who is therefore always mentioned first, is the middle son. Japheth, although he is always named last, is in fact the eldest. There's, now, there's a, there's, we, we see this pattern again and again in Genesis and throughout the Bible. But, but anyway, I don't want to get too you know, wrapped up in that. Now, when it comes to this matter of what uh, occurred in the tent, we, we were told that, that Noah had planted a vineyard, so obviously some, some time has gone by. You don't plant a vineyard and then just harvest the grapes the first year and then make wine the first year. You, you, some time has passed. Uh, and, you know, we've got a small community. We've got this extended household. And, uh, and then Noah drinks the wine. He gets a little tipsy. He, uh, he, he's alone in his tent, but he's naked. And somehow Ham finds his way into the tent. Now, how he gets into the tent without being invited in is, a, is, I think, something worth reflecting upon. But uh, according to Jewish tradition, there's a lot of filling in when it comes to the silence here. And uh, according to certain, tra certain um, strands within the, the Jewish commentary, all kinds of heinous acts are supposed to have occurred in the tent, including homosexual rape and castration. So in terms of the, the, the Jewish commentary, the, 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 the seriousness of the curse that Noah pronounces upon his son Ham uh, almost begs for you know, some kind of heinous crime to justify it. But Cass doesn't go there. Cass doesn't say, no, we, we don't need to, he doesn't say we need to fill in the blank with some kind of horrible act. Hmm. Uh, what he says is this, there's something about seeing your father naked that does sort of, in effect, castrate him, does, in effect, violate him. So here's what he says. <clears throat> Regardless of his motives, and despite his possible desire to forget the past, the important fact remains, Noah was drunk and uncovered in his tent. So Cass does a little speculating on just why Noah was drunk. Uh, his drunkenness robs Noah of his dignity, his parental authority, and his very humanity, prostrate rather than upright. upright. This newly established master of the earth has, in the space of one verse, utterly lost his standing. Worse, instead of escaping from his origins, Noah, in fact, returns to the shameful naked condition of the aboriginal state. Uh, he was uncovered in his tent, stripped of his clothing, Naked, exposed, and vulnerable to disgrace, he appeared merely as a male, not as a father. Not even a humanized, <laughs> rational animal. Noah will not be the last man who degrades and unfathers himself as a result of drink. 
paternal authority and respectability are precarious indeed. So what he's getting at here, of course, is that uh, it's not as though Ham <coughs> sees his father, you know, and then strips him and makes him naked. I mean, Noah has behaved in a way that is not fitting to his dignity as a father, even though he's, be, you know, he obviously he's, he thinks he's, uh, he's out of view and he's in private. But the very, the very act provides the occasion or the situation provides the, the occasion for what does happen, which is a kind of patricide. So what we, what we see is Ham enters the tent, sees his father, and then goes out and tells his brothers. He doesn't go into the tent and say, oops, I shouldn't have done this and avert his eyes, and then keep the matter to himself. There's something going on here that is a kind of patricide, and that's what, what, uh, what Cass gets to. And he says, put it sharp, put sharply. Ham's viewing and telling is metaphorically an act of patricide and incest, an overturning of the father as a father. Without disturbing a hair on Noah's head, Ham engages in father killing. <clears throat> and he goes on to say, uh, this overturning of the father of the father is not the overturning of his biological paternity or the taking of his life. On the contrary, he is overturning precise he is overturned precisely by being reduced to mere male source of seed. Eliminated is the father as authority, as guide, as teacher of law, custom, and a way of life. Ham sees and celebrates only the natural and barest fact of sex. He is blind to everything that makes transmission and rearing possible. So now this is an act of impiety because within the ancient world, within particularly the Latin speaking world where we get the word piety from the Latin pius, uh, piety was the recognition of one's debts and paying uh, due regard to the one to whom you owed something. So in the case of parents, you know, father and mother, mother honoring them. Uh, in the case of the gods, you know, the goods of life and honoring them. Uh, what occurs here by bringing out sort of the mere bare nakedness and the, and the sort of self-degradation of Noah, uh, essentially Ham is, a, is uh, acquitting himself of his debt. He's is, is, is in, in effect saying, I have nothing that I really owe this person apart from the bare fact of my being. Now, that's, a, that's I think, a lot of freight to, to bring into the story, but I do think that it's in, you know, sort of already present in the story. It's not something that's being so much read into it as being brought out of it. And I couldn't help, as I was reading this story, uh, think about the fact that what we had noted earlier, that, that here we have a story of Noah naked. <laughs> in, other, in other words, there's a paradox here. So on the one hand, the pious sons uh, avert their eyes and cover their father's nakedness. And yet, what we have in Scripture is the, you know, the, the story itself preserved for us. And there's something there I'd like to reflect on a bit. But I think what it does is it puts us in, a, in the spot of on the one hand, uh, as pious sons, having the difficult task of knowing something and not knowing something, if you get what I mean. We, we ought to uh, give due respect and regard to those who have gone before us, because we are their debtors, without, as, as uh, Glenn noted, uh, attributing to them messianic status. Uh, we, we, we remember their faults as well, but we don't, we don't <clears throat> revel in the faults. Uh, we, we know that the faults are there. We remember the faults, but in almost a, an embarrassed way, if, if you know what I mean. Yeah. I, and I think that what we, have, what we have in our society at present yeah. is ham. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. we are reveling in the mm -hmm. faults of our ancestors. We, sh we shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, pretend that they didn't have them. <laughs> they were just human beings like us. 
but we yeah. also shouldn't pretend that we don't owe them something. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that's, yeah. that, that's my thought. Yeah. No, no, I think that opens, uh, opens up, uh, uh, you know, a, a current situation that definitely has a, has a, uh, a long history of, of, of shaping that disposition. And I think, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a good case right there. I mean, I think there's a lot, a lot to reflect on there, but that very notion of sort of killing off, killing off the debt owed and the honor owed because one has, has kind of walked into this situation and saw something that didn't, you know, that, 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 um, complicated one's interpretation of one's father as almost having to be perfect as you know i mean jesus puts it a different way i mean he says um how many of your fathers being evil <laughs> yeah, would yeah. do good things to their own children and and this is the exact thing that gets kind of um play you know it creates a kind of impiety saying oh because my father being evil Therefore, I don't owe the honor that I owe both my father, and ultimately it allows me to kind of kill off the so-called patriarchy because here's a person who didn't embody that which only the perfect father is capable of embodying. <laughs> yeah. uh, so there is that tension between, you know, here is the father in whom every fatherhood on earth has been named, but on the other hand, the analogy breaks down, but there, there's still even a case when your father, being evil, still will do things in a way that is analogous to the eternal father. There's something to be noticed there, and that's what I don't think gets kept. So with Ham, the, the analogy is split. All right. Well, you know, one of the things that I've been tremendously uh, disappointed with uh, is the inability of contemporary Christians to address the theme of fatherhood in a way that's genuinely biblical <laughs> and yeah. and socially functional? Uh, yeah. I, ha I have to go to the to the ancient Greeks, or you know, medieval sources, or uh, to Jews. Now, let, let me let me read a section that just follows on this because what what Cass is getting at here is he he uh, actually this chapter is entitled Paternity and Piety. And uh, one of the things he's trying to get across is that, is that Genesis is all about the education of the patriarchs. And, uh, and patriarchy is a good thing. It is, in fact, what makes civilization possible. But anyway, so let me read a little more about what he has to say about fathers. He says, uh, uh, Ham is thus guilty also of a metaphorical castration and the simple act of shamelessly viewing uh, uh, viewing the uncovered naked his, his father's uncovered nakedness he symbolically overturns his father both as a source of life and as moral authority moreover as he speaks irreverently that's an interesting thing as he speaks irreverently about the one or about what he has seen that he understands and celebrates what he has done at first glance, it might seem that there is a possible tension between the two aspects of the crime of Ham. Is the problem a deficiency of natural piety? That is of awe, shame, reverence before the naturally awesome truth of sexuality. Or is the problem a deficiency of conventional moral piety? That is of respect, uh, shame, reverence for legal and moral authority. But further consideration makes it clear that the two aspects are intertwined precisely because the father is the embodiment of both naturally rooted strength and creative power and rationally grounded moral and prescriptive authority. The father as lawgiver is like law itself, a combination of both reason backed by, uh, I should let me say that again, a combination of reason backed by natural force. So let me read that sentence again, because I think I, I, I've, I've uh, kind of messed it up. A father is uh, a father as lawgiver is like law itself, a combination of reason backed by natural force. Later, we will see how the father is in the same way a stand-in for God, creator and commander, both source of life and source of law. Now, this is something that no one wants to deal with today. Mm -hmm. Um. 
let me let me give it just a little. Uh, well, this this is one of the situations where, in my own background, because of kind of the insanity of my of my of my uh, earlier years, um, I found myself in a situation uh, uh, in which I went from being in a home where my father was able to command uh, obedience, perhaps not entirely out of respect, but just simply out of it, just sheer force, uh, to a situation where my mother uh, had her she had a situation she couldn't handle, and I remember I remember I can remember the day uh, where I realized I didn't have to do it what my mother said anymore. I think I was maybe eleven years old. <laughs> Think how early that is. Yeah. Um, I was at a stage of life where, you know, I really needed some strong direction. And there was nobody to provide it. I literally uh, was without any parental supervision for the rest of my life. Um, now, later on, I was able to, uh, to look to men in the church and find models and uh, – and, and uh, pe people that I could could uh, it, it respect and enjoy being around, and I kind of observed their behavior from a distance. But they weren't my father. And uh, so one of the reasons why I've had such a fascination with this particular matter is because of absence. It's not because of presence. <laughs> so, so yeah. but, but one of the things I think that, we don't want to reconcile ourselves to in our society today because of our sort of celebration of self-creation and liberation and all that stuff is the fact that a father brings together precisely uh, what Leon Cass notes, uh, what that the law brings together, you know, rational rationality and force. Mm -hmm. and, and, it, and, and in another way of putting it is simply that this, this is the way in which the created order uh, orients us creatures towards its transcendent end. We we have desires. We have infinite desires. We're created in the image of God. Nothing creaturely is capable of 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 assuaging that. Only the eternal. But what happens when our um, human desires are severed from their transcendent end? Is they're severing themselves from the means to that transcendent end, which is a form that creation has, and that creation has as part of its form the family, which is the first place in which our desires are actually freed from the, the horrific aspects of autonomy. Autonomy for a, for, for a desire is the worst thing for it. It's destructive. And this is what you almost see happening in this story, is that the breaking off of that gift of divine limit in the Father becomes a set, uh, I mean, releases someone from the gift of form, so now their will and their desire is set into a set of parameters that is, is completely an enslavement rather than a freedom. That's exactly the thing that Cass brings out. He says that essentially yeah. what, 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 what follows is a situation in which uh, Ham is a slave, yeah. uh, kind of in fact. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not so much that we're talking about uh, a political scenario so much as we're talking about an ontological kind of moral scenario uh, yeah. in which uh, he's a slave to his passions um, and... Uh, and that's where you get the you know the name hot comes into play. Yeah, so yeah. He's, he's kind of given yeah. himself over to his passions. Yeah, it's and it's worth noting that when Noah pronounced his prophecy or judgment or whatever it is, it's not on him. It's on his son. Yeah, Canaan. And it it is a judgment that is related to Sam's fa uh, Ham's fatherhood. That's exactly the point that Cass makes. Um, so that in itself is a clue, I think, about what the story is really focused on. Right. You know, it, it's, it really is focused around, well, patriarchy. It's focused around the father and what the father is today. Right. Yeah. One of the things that, 
that Cass is great at here is is addressing this whole matter of how how a way of life gets passed down over generations, and that's really what this is you know about how how the way of life, which is holiness and righteousness, an orientation toward God, which itself has to be acquired over several generations. In other words, there are a number of lessons that have to be taught. Um, I'm in the middle of the of the book right now where he's addressing the education of Abram or Abraham. Mm-hmm. And that he's done, does a marvelous job with that. But uh, but then, you know, how do you pass this on? I mean, how do you, you know, you know, uh, well, you, you, tradition for one thing is, is, is important, but also it's got to be understood as being something that is impressed upon those who follow. This is it sort of like find yourself or whatever makes you happy or follow your bliss. Or, <laughs> I just want you to be in. I just want you to or reach for the stars. Your dreams can come true. <laughs> it's not, it's none of that. You know, you're born into a situation where, where you are receiving a way of life. Yeah. This is not about self-actualization. That's right. Now that's something that's been, I think altogether lost in the contemporary Christian church altogether yeah. lost. Yeah. I mean, most preachers that I know are, 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 you know, lifestyle coaches who are trying to help you find your bliss now, you know, or whatever, yeah. you know, it's all about self-actualization and sort of your dreams and being what you're supposed to be and all this kind of stuff. It, and it's, it's, and it's very tied to that notion of autonomous desire, which is, right. is the byproduct of ham. Right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, 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 there's a whole lot. <laughs> the, the, all, the, all the worship choruses are all about ham, you know, sort yeah. of like getting passionate and, yeah. you, know, you know, sort of getting lost in your passions and this kind of stuff. But anyway. Um, I, what, I'm going to uh, lose this some listeners again. Uh, the, <laughs> entire, the entire thing about churches being relevant. How many churches have you seen that are being relevant to church? You know, or right, something. right, right. What relevance says is we are going to let our society set our agenda for us. That's right. And we are going to be responding to what the society demands, which means you get, I use the word loosely, worship services that are a concert plus a TED talk. <laughs> you know, That's right. That's right. And, and the, the messages are all about felt needs or they're about whatever is currently going on in society. You're not dealing with a systematic approach to teach people God's perspective on the world. You're constantly responding to the world's perspective on the world. That's right. Yes. Yeah. 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 I think, I think it's right. And that, and this makes a nice segue to the next pa- sort of part of the time I want, you know, next part of the podcast, I want to talk a little bit about Babel because I think that the story of, of, of Noah's sons is prelude to Babel. And Nimrod, as uh, I mentioned earlier, is a descendant of, of Ham. And he, uh, uh, we're told, is, a, you know, a mighty hunter before the Lord and that there's uh, a... Uh, well, and a project <laughs> that, that he, I, you know, I, I was thinking about calling this episode uh, the Bible's first dystopia. <laughs> what we have here is a dystopia uh, yeah. in Babel. And uh, we've got uh, this uh, sort of introduction to this project that on the, on the surface seems to be, well, innocuous or even praiseworthy. I mean, here they have, a te- you know, here we have, you know, a, a community of people who are united. I mean, isn't that what it's all about? Being united. I mean, they have, you know, there's only one country, you know, think about that. I mean, it's John yeah. Lennon could sing about this. Imagine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, imagine. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Babel is imagine. <laughs> there's, there's one language. There's no God. <laughs> <laughs> it's all there, baby. And yeah. so now, even, uh, even Yoko Ono was there. No, it's <laughs> <laughs> so. Bad so joke. what we have, <laughs> but what we have here is this this setup where we have what we what we would assume from a secular point of view is is just this great, you know, sort of place where you know we're making a name for ourselves. We're 
human achievement is, is what it's all about. You know, we're going to build this tower and this tower is going to reach all the way to the heavens. Now you can think Chris, about the, yeah. They're making a Shem for themselves. Yes. A Shem. That's yeah. right. That's right. And of course this sets up the story with Abraham, which comes yeah. later. Where God says, I'm going to make a Shem for you. That's exactly right. Yeah. So you can either try to make a name for yourself or get, you can let God make you a name, you know, and you know, what's the better name? I think that's, 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 you know, clearly what's going on here. But the fact that Nimrod, background from what we used to say, what a Nimrod, <laughs> <laughs> meaning an idiot. But, but in, this, in the story, you know, he's a pretty impressive character. He's a, he's a mighty man, a great hunter. And, uh, and the, I think what's implied is that he secured his, his, his kingdom uh, in a way that uh, demonstrates great strength of will and even force, physical force. And you've got this community that's united by a common language, which means, which means they, in some sense, share a common mind. And when the Lord comes down to see what they're up to, the Lord doesn't say, oh, what a bunch of futile, you know, foolish, you know, uh, people. He says, you know, if they, if they, you know, if they really want to, they can pretty much do anything they want at this point um, because they can work together this way. I better make sure this doesn't continue. <laughs> and then what does God do? He confuses their speech. But I think, but I think this whole matter of, you know, this sort of secular dystopia, again, with a, with a, a single language, uh, and in some sense implied a control of language, uh, is makes possible an assault on heaven. There's, there's a kind of apotheosis, you know, a sense of which we, we raise ourselves up through our work or mm -hmm. our works and acquire a kind of divine status. Mm -hmm. And it's a, uh, a project that uh, is a problem in a number of ways. One, obviously, is this is not what we were made for. In other mm -hmm. words, we're, we're here to represent another. We're not yeah. here to make a name for ourselves. And then there's also the fact that essentially this is uh, a formula for uh, damnation. I mean, if we understand mm -hmm. damnation in an ontological sense, in the sense that what is eternal life? Eternal life is being united to your eternal source, your creator, and enjoying his life forever. Yeah, what, what what you have going on here is exactly counter the 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 creation and the image of God, and so um, it's the image of God when it's not placed within the parameters and forms that actually govern and orient that image, um, give it content, orientation, and meaning. In other words, what do we have in the in the the divine pattern of the work week? We have it culminating in a Sabbath. A Sabbath is a limit placed on the work week, which says ultimately the final chief end of the work week is not the work week, not the workers of the world unite. It's, <laughs> it's Sabbath and communion. It's not even the work of justice. It is, the, it is rest and communion and leisure, if you want, in communion with, with the Creator. And what is the Sabbath? It's a holy day. It's made for man, not man for the Sabbath. But but it is it is that which is characteristic of the image of God. And so it, there's a limit right there, but that limit is not an enslavement or a holding back of one's creative potentials. It's actually the right kind of container for the proper freedom to, to flourish and move towards our perfection the way we were created to do it. What this does is actually undermines all of that. By not having that limit, we're unleashing the, 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 um, the uncontained power which allows for, in the worst way, the most unjust and um, evil, um, I don't even know how to put it in some place, babble being, kind of the archetype of what idolatry and evil writ large will look like. Right. Yeah, two, uh, several observations here. First of all, I don't, you, you will find passages in Isaiah, for example, that talk about the redemption of Egypt, that talk about the redemption of Assyria. 
I don't ever recall a passage talking about the redemption of Babylon. Interesting. Um, a second thing is that you'll notice that what happens when you remove boundaries is you get totalitarianism. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the third thing that came to mind, I've been reading, I've been reading on medieval legal theory lately, hmm. particularly origin of the idea of human rights, what uh, rights are. Yeah. And there are two interesting things that sort of fit in with a lot of things we've talked about here so far. One of them is that the idea of liberty Originally, when they talked about libertas, the concept was you have the right, freedom, whatever, to do what you will within a particular set of prescribed boundaries. Yeah. You are not permitted to become to do something immoral or illegal. There are boundaries around it, and those boundaries define liberty. Anything between those boundaries, you're free to do, but you can't transgress them. That's the concept of liberty in, it, in its original form. It gets modified a little bit over time, but that, that's it. Again, freedom can only exist. We use freedom instead of liberty, but true freedom can only exist within boundaries. Right. And, and it's interesting because even when you get to Immanuel Kant, who actually, I think, breaks us away from that transcendental set of ends um, that, that shape form and, and fulfill this, what you get is someone who knows that we still have to have law. The law becomes the worst kind, even though it seems to be freedom. It's self-legislation from our own resources. But we are the imposer of form. You can't do away with form because you get anarchy and the inability ever to, to I mean, that, that becomes kind of, you know, the Promethean nightmare. So, but, but this kind of imposition of form um, because it, it, it isn't the truthful enactment of our creatureliness with the forms given to it, but the imposition of our will, it ends up becoming almost a violence imposed on ourselves and our society, which, you know, chase it way down to the road is the way we do violence to our body through technology to bring it into conformity with our will rather than the order of creation. Anyway, there's a lot there, but I mean, is it that well, same? Yeah. Yeah, we can tie this directly into music. When you listen to, um, if you listen to <laughs> a number of these other avant-garde composers who are trying to eliminate all boundaries, all limitations, all everything on music. John what, Cage and yeah, Cage, just, yeah, yeah, what you get yeah. is noise. Yeah. Is it, what, what, Nobody it, listens to this stuff anymore. Yeah, is it is it Schoenenberg is is the Schoenenberg the twelve tone system and all of that? Yeah, yeah, and right. yeah, and actually, yeah. Strange thing, I, when I studied music at uh, in at VCU uh, Music Performing Arts School, uh, Deacon Newland was a student, the chief student of Schoenberg. Wow! And for all of his, check this out. For all of his kind of breaking down the kind of you know classical tonality and trying to to bring it into this kind of discordant twelve tone rock. He was the kind of person that was the most controlling. He would, this is his piano student. He would not let her date. And it wasn't his wow. daughter. Wow. This, was his, this was a student. This, so this uh. shows you the way they, they don't even, they're not even able to, to live in that kind of um, oh, yeah. freedom. They're freaky, as, as, freaky people here, freaky people. Well, as Francis yeah. Schaeffer pointed out, John Cage's hobby was he was a mycologist. <laughs> mushrooms. <laughs> How do you collect yeah. mushrooms if you aren't paying really close attention to the rules? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But the, what, one more thing, the concept of rights, the, word, the medieval word that translates as rights is one of the words that can be used for law. So it gets tied to natural law and things like that as opposed to le uh, positive law legislation. But the way they defined law in this sense of rights is it was based on reason. In mm -hmm. reason to understand what is necessary for human flourishing. Right. Yeah, we've, we've reduced it and, to... And again, we talked about reason before here as well, and right. all of this ties together. Yeah, yeah we, we've reduced it to will... And mm -hmm. if, if reason is not directing the will, what is? It's the passions. 
Um, anyway, I think that we're back to him. Yeah, we're back <laughs> to him. Yeah. And what we, I think what we have here is, is there's a kind of coming together with regard to parental authority and with the, the authority of God. There's, you know, it's been noted many times when people have looked at the Decalogue that the transitional command is the fifth commandment to honor your father and mother. You know, before that, we're clearly, uh, you know, directing our regard to God. And then when we get past that, that commandment, we're looking at our fellow man. And uh, there is a there is a significant sort of uh, sort of mediating role that fathers and mothers play with regard to children. In a sense, I mean, I've heard this said many times that uh, civil authorities, in some sense, stand in for your parents. Um, mm-hmm. uh, we we kind of look at it the other way around, I think, today, or maybe we don't even think about it at all. Local parentis is just kind of like whatever became of that. <laughs> but but the uh, the idea that that are, that parents are the ones who really embody uh, in their care for a child what appears to be sort of things that can't be reconciled in a linear fashion. Take for example, justice and mercy. You know, either you're just or you're merciful. You know, love. You know, uh, and truth. You know, either you say what's on your mind or you sort of, you know, mollycoddle people <laughs> because mm-hmm. you don't want them to be hurt. You know. <laughs> Those guys. Now, there's a place, of course, for nuance. There's a place for putting things in the best way and all that kind of stuff. But, but I think that parents within the Judeo-Christian framework have this incredibly important position with regard to, uh, you know, regard and 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 how piety, meaning proper regard for those who have been your benefactors, actually functions, and so. This this moment in which in which uh, Ham is impious with regard to his father's clear failing um, somehow what gets passed down to his heirs is almost a you know a license to do as you please not with regard to your you know your ancestors and defying them, but toward the, 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 you know, the the highest authority of all, uh, God, there is some, in some sense in Babel, an assault on heaven. Um, whether we bring, whether the, with the, whether the tower was understood to bring God down or Mm -hmm. raise man up, there's in some sense a, uh, a landing on the beach at Normandy, you could say, with regard to this, to this tower. It's kind of an assault vehicle. Now, what what uh, Cass does uh, when he treats the sort of the situation at Babel, when he sort of gets into the the the, the dystopia that was Babel, he points out uh, some failings uh, in the project, and and. Some of the some of the stuff that he has to say has to do with language and, and how language functions. What what he's what he tries to bring across is that when when you have language when language loses touch with reality, what you end up with is this sort of self contained, hermetically sealed system of, of ideas that are, is, is not informed by anything outside it. <laughs> yeah, in, in, in a sense, what you get is language functioning the same way technology can function. And you have the imposition of form, and that imposition is not governed by created kinds, natures oriented to the transcendent, but from that will to power, if you will. I think Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's analysis of that was, I think, spot on. Right. So then the question becomes, you know, how do we get back in touch with reality and, ha- and so that our language can be actually expressing things that are real, that are bigger than us, than bigger than our society, than, than our constructions? We know that the postmodernists don't believe there's anything out there to get in touch with. Okay, we, we know that. Well, what we should say to them is, okay, you build your little babble over there and we'll see how it turns out. But these but people, they, but they, they, they know it absolutely. <laughs> that's right, that's right, that's, but but I suspect that they that deep down inside they know that they're a cancer and they have to feed on healthy tissue in order to sustain their own life, yeah. their own lives. And well, so you know, to to use a, a single a single example of that, take a look right now at a very popular book called White Fragility. I've heard about it, but I've not read it. 
what white fragility says, you know, one of the core concepts is that whiteness is essentially racism. And that if you are white, you are automatically racist and there is no escaping it. There's no redemption, no amount of wokeness is ever going to break you out of your whiteness. And thus you are a, an eternal oppressor. Okay. What that does is it sets up a situation in which you have permanent war against, of one against another. You have a permanent enemy and you define your own position in terms of that which you oppose. Right, right. And it, it ultimately, it ends up being a parasitic worldview. It's also so tremendously self-defeating. So if whiteness means penicillin, does that mean you don't use penicillin? I mean, it was a white person that came up with penicillin. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, it, but it also, I think, I think what the, the gains of it um, are going to um, unhappily end with the losses. I think this is, again, Nietzsche, for all of his perverse, <laughs> he, he was endowed with a lot of prophetic Nietzsche was, insight. Nietzsche was brilliant. He was, because his point is, is right now the only reason that you're able to do anything with that kind of narrative is because of, of, of a certain kind of guilt that comes out of a, a Christian consciousness, but is distorted. But once that guilt is gone, you've, you've created the other side, the ubermensch, and, and that is the one that says, you know what, I'm not guilty. If, if I'm inherently X um, and there's nothing I can do about it, I have two choices. I can wallow in guilt and let you become my oppressor, or I'm going to say, you know what, if it's inherent about me, then it's natural and it isn't either. It's not, neither good nor bad. And so I'm going to use it to my advantage. And guess what? I'm going to lord and dominate. And that's what you get in yeah. specifically the racist versions of Norse paganism that we've talked about before. Yeah. Right. That, goes, that go to a, a white nationalist or white supremacist kind of, of Norse paganism. Not all of them do, but that particular branch is doing exactly what you just described. You know, one of the things that this makes me wonder is, you know, when we think about sort of the woke uh, sort of a elite in our society, I wonder if there's a deep uh, reservoir of suspicion that that's actually what could happen if they don't work very hard to suppress uh, that particular, you know, blonde beast from emerging. Because, yeah. because if, we do, if we do say, in effect, that, you know, even justice is just a kind of, you know, constructed notion, yeah. then that means that I can kill with impunity uh, because if I can somehow a sort of expunge from my consciousness any sense of, responsibility for anybody else or debt to anyone else or whatever, then I'm, I'm free to do whatever I want to do. Now that, 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 you know, we've, we've gone, gone down a long road here and I think that, you know, we're getting to a point where you should probably wrap things up with this episode. But I guess, I guess the thing I wanted to get across is as I was reading this book by Cass and it's a, it's a marvelous book and I, and I, I can endorse it. Not, not, not every, not everything in it I agree with. I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't recognize that Jesus is the Messiah. So, okay, we've got a, we've got a point here of a <laughs> significant disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Nevertheless, there is a great deal that he sees here that, frankly, because of the formulaic approach to the Bible that many Reformed teachers take, they miss things. And he, because he's not sort of constrained by that formulaic, you know, this is, this is just the way it is. And I, I, I was thinking just today, I was thinking about, I saw something from N.D. Wilson. N.D. Wilson wrote the introduction to a, to a, a, a Canon Press uh, edition of Orthodoxy by, by Chesterton. And, and Nate, uh, in his introduction to the book, refers, it talks about um, Chestertonian Calvinism. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, by the way, we ought to have Nate on the show sometime just to have yeah, him talk a little bit fun. about Chase yeah. Tony. That would Tony be Kevin. fun. That would be great. Yeah. But anyway, uh, th but the idea that um, that oh boy, I just lost my train of thought. Chestertonian <laughs> <laughs> Calvinism. <laughs> yes, Chestertonian Calvinism. I remember that part. But how did I get to Chestertonian Calvinism? But 
with regard to this larger, pro oh, I know where I was getting at. The, what we have uh, within the reform world is most preachers think like accountants. Most reformed teachers are accountants at heart. And what, what a Chestertonian Calvinist is, is an artist at heart who can do accounting. <laughs> There's an enormous difference. The, the accountant couldn't paint, but the yeah. painter can learn accounting. You, you get him again, yeah. and so. But when we when we think about Genesis, we have a bunch of guys who've got their little, you know, sort of rubric, and they're saying, "I got to find Jesus in here somewhere," and so they're doing everything possible. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not against finding types, and I'm not against finding mm -hmm. Christ in the Old Testament. Believe me, I, he's there. He's there. He is the yeah. Word. But That's right. in the in the in in his creation, there is a manifold sort of nature to things and there are layers of things going on we've talked about this before with regard to medieval approaches to interpreting the bible but one of the things that these guys so often and it frustrates me a miss is just stuff that Cass is getting at when he's looking at this he's saying well there's this and there's this and there's this and i'm saying you're right it's there it's there, it's there. Yeah. why isn't it why isn't your typical reformed preacher saying it's there yeah and and, and what Go ahead, Glenn. I, uh, th this, this is my problem in general with most Christian theologies, that they believe that since what they believe is right, everything else must be wrong. They don't recognize, especially within the Protestant world, they don't recognize the possibility that Scripture, even their theological categories, could be multivalent. It could have multiple significations. So we look at, my favorite example, we look at atonement exclusively in terms of forensic justification. We completely ignore theosis, which is the core of the Eastern Orthodox view. The Eastern Orthodox tend to ignore the forensic side. What we need is to say not, I'm right, so you're wrong, but I'm right, but so are you. We're looking at different aspects of the same thing, which is much richer than either of our theological systems um, by themselves would would lead us to. Right. The same way with approaching Scripture. You know, we've got our right way of doing it, but we've got to realize that Scripture itself is multivalent. Yeah, and, and I think one of the problems is this, this strange irony develops, because on the one hand, we, we want to be they want to look for Christological types, but on the other hand, they want to have this flattened notion of historical grammatical approach, which yeah, basically would, 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 do, would do away with that altogether. Yeah. And, and, and I, I think one of the things you have here, you know, um, you, you see it very much with Aquinas, is that you, you have, of course, the, the, the final and chief end of all things, but also the, the creaturely, um, ends which are not ultimate and final, but they are legitimate and a, a created good. And so, this is where the the form and the beauty of the creation have a, a sort of um, they're an analogous to their eternal perfection um, and their root in God. But also, there is a dignity about them, and this is that balancing act. I mean, we're looking at the 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 creation in all the various ways in which there is a gift there in all of its particularities, which is a gift as the thing that it is, but also as a gift in a, in a larger set of things. And this is what's very hard sometimes, I think. Um, and this is why we're easy to throw one off for the other, right? So I have to become so Christocentric that I become almost Gnostic, bizarrely, right, incarnation, but also Gnostic in the sense that nothing else has significance. No, to love Christ and pursue Christ and to know him first is not to not love anything else. It's actually to love it the right way. And I think this is what we're doing here is we're kind of unpacking the ways in which creation has been given a certain um, gift of form that we are to love the right way. And when we love it the right way, it's a part of the, the, the flourishing of the creature towards its eternal end, fulfilled in Christ and having its final meaning in Christ, but not reduced to Christ. <laughs> it is a distinct thing that is a creature of his, which serves a certain purpose, but is not erased in its union with Christ. I think that's a great 
point at which to sort of wrap things up. We've gotten <laughs> to the point where we, we should probably do that. So Glenn, is there anything you want to say as we conclude? Uh, no, I, uh, well, there are a lot of things I could say, but I think we'll just conclude. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I think this has been a fun conversation and worthwhile one. You know, when we think about how do we love our ancestors, I wonder if anybody ever considers that. I think in one sense, uh, a pious uh, regard for them without, uh, you know, making them into plaster saints, as we noted before. We, 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 when we consider Noah and his sons, they knew that their father was drunk, but they didn't talk a lot about it and they just averted their eyes and covered him. I think that we all need that kind of uh, help every once in a while. I saw this marvelous uh, interview on Fox News with Cornell West and Robert P. George. Yeah. They were talking about this very thing, how you know, tearing, down, tearing down statues is kind of like Ham staring at his father naked and going out and telling everybody. And I, and I really don't think that's going to help us here, folks. I think that what we need to do is we need to be realistic about the past, uh, but we also need to be, I think, grateful for the good things that we've received. And I guess that's how I'd like to leave it. Anyway, thanks a lot for listening to the Theology Podcast. We'll catch you next time. Bye-bye. Bye now. Bye.